Okay, thank you all for uh, joining us, and I would like to uh, invite the participants of our panel to the stage, and then I'll introduce them. I'd like to invite Professor Rivka Karmi, President of Ben Gurion University of the Negev, Professor Donna E. Shalala, President of the University of Miami, Professor Franz N. Cordova, President of Purdue University, and Professor Chagit Messer Yaron, President of the Open University in Israel. We have four female presidents on stage, four leading scientists which have successfully broken any ceiling uh, that, uh, and uh, have made it to the top for sure. Four women which are inspiration to many others who look at them and know it is possible. And yet, again, we meet here, uh, we see this rare sight for us Israelis to see such a uh, a strong uh, feminine panel. Whenever we have panels, we usually have one woman where we look hard to, where can we find the woman on the panel now? It, it was really a, a rare sight for me. But we are here to tackle once again uh, what frankly should have long ago become a non-issue. Uh, but somehow it seems to stick with us, this glass ceiling. And even if the glass ceiling has been broken, is it not being met with a concrete roof? Mm -hmm. Um, so, let me introduce our distinguished members of the panel, and let me add a personal note, if, if I may, uh, because I do moderate many panels, and I think I have not come across a panel so inspirational and so interesting for me, because it is really a rare opportunity to hear for such accomplished women how they made it, and I will try and keep the panel with your permissions, I've received your permissions, um, to try and also um, take this opportunity to see um, and hear from their personal experience how they made it to the top, what is possible, what needs to be changed, and what they are doing to bring upon change. So I will introduce them um, by order of, of, of the sitting, so I will not have any problems. <laughs> so I'll start with uh, Professor Rivka Karmi, which you all uh, know or should know by now. Uh, and she was, of course, elected to serve as president of Ben Gurion University uh, in May 2006, making history in Israel. She was the first and still the only, uh, uh, well, not the only because we have Chagit, um, president of uh, the Israel University. And uh, Rivka Karmi was also the first woman who was elected in 2000 to be the dean of the Faculty of Health Science in Ben Gurion uh, University. And I will. Um, spare you the rest because you all know her very well. Um, sitting next to her, we have the real great honor to have Professor Donna E. Shalala from the state. She is a professor of political science and president of the University of Miami. In 1993, President Clinton appointed her U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, where she served and survived in politics for eight years, <laughs> becoming the last longest serving HHS secretary in U.S. history. And as HH Secretary, she directed the welfare reform process, made health insurance available to millions of children through the approval of all child's health insurance programs. And we saw how hard those mo mo moves are in the states. She raised child immuni immunization rates to the highest level in history. She led major reforms of the FDA drugs approval process and food safety system. And she, um, and uh, at the end of her tenure, the eighth as HH secretary, HHS secretary, the Washington Post described her as one of the most successful of government managers of modern time. So this is <laughs> Professor John <laughs> And in June 2008, President Bush presented her with the President Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. Next to her, we have, of course, Professor Franz Ann Cordova from the United States who is joining us, and she's an international renowned astrophysics, president of the Purdue University and professor of physics and astronomy, um, which was chief scientist at NASA and awarded NAS NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Ser Service Medal. Uh, Cordova was previously included as one of the America's 100 brightest scientists under age of 40 by Science Digest magazine and recently appeared among the 101 top influential leaders in Hispanic U.S. by Latino Leaders magazine. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts Science in 2008 and has visited Israel twice in her career, 
last time as chief scientist at NASA, wherein she met Israel's president. So we're very honored to have you here today. And last but not least, of course, who made it on time, Professor Chagit Yaron Messer, who has been president of the Open University in Israel since 2008. She has a PhD in electronic engineering from Tel Aviv University and a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University. And she was, between the years 2000 and 2003, she uh, was the chief scientist at the Ministry of Science in Israel. I think you also made history being the first woman appointed to that job. <laughs> yes, we, it, it, and um, she has um, numerous publications and uh, uh, Throughout the years, Professor Messer Yaron is also interested in various aspects of higher education, science policy, including ethics, science society interplay, and um, her book, Capitalism in the Ivory Tower, was published in 2008, and, eight, sorry, and she is also committed to the advancement of women in science and technology, and let me tell you a secret, uh, if I may, Professor uh, Chagit Messer Yaron was the one who mentored Rivka Karmi and made her take the initial step as dean, and the rest is history. So let me uh, finish with the introductions and uh, get to what I know. I mean, standing like next to women like this really makes your, your knees um, wobbly because I think of the way they have done and how easy it is in journalism. All you have to do is report. You don't have to really do a lot. Um, um, and I just want to say a quick word to the audience. Um, as I was um, preparing for this panel, I uh, thought that as we don't get this opportunity to hear from firsthand from such uh, accomplished ladies, I do invite the audience, men and women alike, um, to feel uh, to feel that, to see this as an open discussion, and I will try and, and, and see if anyone has something to say or ask, and try to see how I can uh, I can. Uh, incorporate you in the, in the discussion. Anyway, I will save time for questions, so uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. Let me start. Um, I think I will take a seat over there, if it's okay. I'll feel much better. Thank you. I always say I never leave my mic because what am I without a microphone, you know? <laughs> um, let me ask by starting you all a question. Um, when, uh, Professor Shalala, when you started your journey, did you have any idea where you wanted to end up? Was there a plan, a goal, or it just happened? It just happened. <laughs> but um, I did not have a grand plan. In fact, I wanted to be a journalist when I was a little kid. So, <laughs> I, and the reason I'm not is because there weren't any jobs when I finished graduate school in journalism, so I went on to be an academic. Um, no, I didn't have a grand plan, and it's a big problem when I talk to students because they all come in you know, with their grand plan, and I keep telling them what you have to be is awake and take advantage of opportunities and network. Often students say to me, how do you get to be uh, a member of a president's cabinet? My answer is look around you, figure out which one of your friends um, is going to run for president and stay in stu touch for 30 years. <laughs> but, but you didn't do any of that. No, I, just, I, I was just awake and I took advantage of opportunities as they came along. I was more tactical uh, than anything else, but I had very traditional credentials to get where I ended up doing. A very good education, a PhD, I was a distinguished academic, so I could take advantage of opportunities as they came along. But every step you took, was it just to achieve the next step or was there a point in your career where you said, okay, I understand that I have what it takes and now I wanna be in the cabinet or until now I wanna be a president no, of the university? Until I had this job. This is the president job. The president of the University of Miami. Every job I had before that the consensus was I wasn't qualified. <laughs> so I spent a career overreaching. And um, for who, me, it was who just- Who thought, who, who, I mean, they told you don't, you weren't qualified? Yes. The consensus was whether it was the university I was becoming president of or a government job I was taking, the general consensus was I was too young and not, uh, and not qualified for the job. So, you know, 
if I was to describe my career, it was a search for the next adventure. And I and must it, ask you another question because this is really... It had nothing to do with a climb. But what made you insist on the position where everyone told you you weren't qualified for? Because a lot of women tend to um, always say thank you for where they are and not think they can take something... I mean, they always underestimate their, their um, opportunity, uh, their I'm abilities. Because I'm fearless. <laughs> Basically, I'm fearless. <laughs> I just... I'm, I'm so afraid of being bored that, you know, and, and I didn't move that much of my career. It's not like I bounced around every two years, not at all. But I, if, if someone approached me, people approach me all the time for jobs, if it sounded like a great adventure and I would learn something, add a new skill, but it was really, I wasn't that, I believe that people over-intellectualize too much on these kinds of, of moves. So it was really a search for the next adventure. If it sounded like it was going to be a great adventure, I took a shot. I don't think they teach that at business school for no, planning your career. <laughs> Professor Cordova, how was it for you? Um, was there a goal? Was there a plan? Was there, did, you, did you even dare to think you could be chief scientist in NASA? Did you even dare to think that you could be a president of a university, such a big and important university? Well, I'm very, very similar to Donna Shalala in that um, I, I didn't know what a president of university was or the chief scientist of NASA. I also just um, believed in experiences and in trying to reach for excellence and do my best in whatever I was doing. I, I had, um, actually when I was seven years old, I was fascinated by science and I did want to become a nuclear physicist, but I had no role models or inspiration in high school on that course. And in fact, my mother thought I'd go to college to get married, to find somebody <laughs> to, to get married. And I'm fond of telling students today that it was much easier to become a rocket scientist than to uh, find somebody <laughs> who would marry me. <laughs> <laughs> but he is here. <laughs> Do you want to stand up, I yeah. think? Um, my, actually, th this is relevant to my first trip to Israel. I, so instead of becoming a scientist as an undergraduate, I majored in English because that was more acceptable for young women. And I love writing and also journalism and being in, in dramatic productions and debate and all that. And so I, I wrote a story and I won a national contest sponsored by Mademoiselle Magazine. And some of the writers I admired most, like Sylvia Plath and Joan Didion, had competed for that, so I wanted to compete. I won it. They uh, gave me a trip to Israel to write a story for, them, for the, this woman's magazine, Mademoiselle Magazine for College Women. And on, uh, if, if one looks at that issue, so we published the August issue of their magazine in 1969, there's a little picture of me, and it said just almost exactly what Donna just said. It said, I want to be always experiencing, traveling, reaching for new things. That, that is my character as well. Okay, that's it. Oh, at the end, I'll tell you why I'm asking, because it's a question I always ask women. It's, it's amazing. I always get such interesting and different qu answers. Chagit, how was it for you, Professor Messer, you're on, sorry. No, no, I'm Chagit. <laughs> um, what I plan to do and what I knew that I like to do is to be an academician. Because it's good at life to be in <laughs> academia. And I was like you, I was interested in uh, science and technology. So it was quite natural to finish my undergraduate and then graduate and then I was offered the position at Tel Aviv University, which I was, uh, was happy to accept. Uh, actually, I must say that uh, I keep, it's still the, the thing that I like most to do. I'm just back from a scientific conference, and, and I really want to get back there as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, but at a certain time, I was offered other things to do, and I realized that I can do both. So whenever I get an, a new proposition for a job as a chief scientist or something, I checked it. And as women usually do, I, I, I had a short, li a long list saying, if it meets all conditions, then I can do it. And then they told me, yes, you can do this and so and so. So everything was checked 
is okay, so I said yes. And then it turns out that uh, <laughs> it's not the way it looked, but... Uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was lucky enough, and actually I must say that I admire um, Rivka, my friend, for uh, putting herself to positions. I was al al always offered a position. I considered it, I found it uh, interested, and that's why I decided to take it. And I consult friends before doing it. So Rivka said you should take the Open University, right? And I follow your steps. Right. But Rivka, uh, uh, Professor Carmi, sorry. Uh, Rivka is following. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rivka. <laughs> well, I, I thought about it. I was born. I wasn't born MD or professor <laughs> or anything like that. Just bare Rivka. Anyway. Um, Professor Messeron said that you were different, but you were also different just on a certain, you never thought about where you are now when you set out to study or when you started uh, climbing the ladder. You had, a, you had a goal, but it wasn't where you were now. Well, the only thing I never, ever actually considered was being a president of a university. But other than that, I did have a big master plan, I have to admit, and I had it since, at the age of 14. I was 14 years old when I decided to be uh, a geneticist, a researcher, and actually to correct the injustice that was done to Rosalind Franklin by the fact that she didn't manage, well, she, uh, she died before, but even if she would have been alive at the time, probably she wouldn't have gotten the Nobel Prize for uh, for um, uh, identifying or finding the double helix, so I had this you know very naive uh, scientific vision that I'm going to correct this injustice and uh, and be a great scientist. In at genetics. the age of fourteen, fourteen. You exactly. remember you remember yourself at the age of fourteen saying, "I am going to, to be the what?" Point. And I know exactly when when it was. I, I know exactly. You know, I had a project in biology. By the way, I. At that time, we didn't have, we had either um, a realistic kind of reality, you know, and, and humanistics. We didn't have uh, any uh, big variety of subjects to take, to uh, choose from. We had only one year of biology and we had a project. And I had, I was doing, you know, a project uh, 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 about something that happens, happening in, in, the, in the cell, you know, crossing over for, for those who know what's crossing over the cell. And I said, at that moment, I said, you know, I'm going to be a researcher in genetics. But then I was also, throughout my life, seizing the opportunities. So, you know, I had uh, my eyes on the ball all the time, but then, every now and then, when I had another opportunity, or I had to be a little bit more flexible with my plans, I, oh, I, I definitely did it. And, and, you know, if you would have asked me, if not for that, probably I would never, never get to where I was, um, where and, 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 and very early on, I knew that I was going to be the dean of the medical school. And you know, and when I, I think I was the first time when I verbalized it, I was, I think, 24, 20 year, 25 years old, and my peers thought that I was crazy, because you know, uh, at that time, nobody, knows, nobody knew what was the dean of the medical school, one, and definitely <laughs> not the name of, 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 the, of your medical school uh, dean. But you were you were the age of these students. Yes, about this Th age. Let me. Any of you know what they want to be? Anyone you you want to be a dean of a faculty that you're studying? <laughs> Head of the university? Girls? Anyone? Do you know the dean? Anyone? Any uh, ambitions? Knowing? Pinpointing? None? Nothing? Nothing. What about Barack? What do you want to do? <laughs> I I'm a know that Barack has an uh, has an, an idea. What what's your goal? You don't know. <laughs> You're being polite. <laughs> okay. It's interesting. It is very interesting. And I, I know it is very unusual because uh, throughout the years I had this, you know, the chance to talk to women and, 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 uh, and exchange ideas. And for most women that I uh, encountered, for them it was like, you know, by luck, somehow they got there. You know, they had a good opportunity. They mostly had men around them that gave them the opportunity. So it wasn't about them. It was about the environment, about, you know, luck, etc. It wasn't like that for me, and I'm not just boasting about it. It was very unusual at the time as well. And, you know, I, I'm, 
except from, from, uh, from Rivka, we all heard um, our distinguished ladies saying that they were offered jobs, which were interesting, and then, and then they seized the opportunity. But I think, and research shows, that that is very um, symptomatic of women, that they, are, they wait to be offered. And I think that is one of the reasons which, which also is, is, is shown on all the work for tasks and, and so on. Um, which explain the scissor effect, which is very um, clear in Israel, also in Europe. I think in the States, it's, it's the scissors have closed, but the scissor is the higher you go in the academia, the less women you see. And they start, they're about 50%, over 50% in the first degree, and they fall into, um, in Israel, an average of 12.8 um, of full professor, um, and when they start from lectures at 43.6%. So there you have it. And we only have these two uh, presidents and their, their pioneers. Um, so there are a lot of reasons for the falling off the academia wagon. And they're known and they're described as the, as the leaky pipeline and be the postdoctorate, be the requirements, the recruiting, the competition, the, the networking, the, promo the promoting, the politically. It, it could be technical and it could be cultural. Uh, and I would like to ask uh, Professor Shalala, from your experience, what barriers did you have to overcome? Uh, and what made it different for you if you think you had to overcome a gender barrier? Well, I certainly did early in my career. Um, those statistics are interesting. I just, uh, a few years ago, I chaired for the National Academy of Sciences a panel on the future of women in science and engineering, which revealed that long list in the academy. Uh, the universities have been particularly bad at, at not just promoting women, but giving them opportunities to get PhDs and then to get positions in universities, then to support them to become full professors. And we're getting better. Some of the great engineering schools, um, uh, like Purdue, which has other subjects, obviously, have done a better job trying to get women through the pipeline. Oh, I ran into discrimination from the time I started graduate school. The chairman of my department, when I went to him for financial aid, told me he would not give any money to women because they were just going to get married and not use their PhDs. When I complained to the dean, because I was persistent about it, the dean was horrified. It was the beginning of the women's movement in the United States. And he believed, he had a very enlightened view. He thought if the graduate school educated more women, uh, the graduate school would become more famous because the universities were going to be looking for women in the future. So he went out of his way to provide financial aid to increase the number of women uh, who had PhDs. When I took my first job uh, at a university after I had my PhD, the chairman of the department called me in at the end of my first year and said, I had embarrassed the men in the department because I published more than all of them did combined. <laughs> and that he wanted to assure me that I would not get tenure because they had never tenured a woman. <laughs> At the time, I had a standing offer from Columbia University, which I immediately took because I didn't want to deal with this person. Uh, so at the beginning of my career, there was blatant discrimination, blatant discrimination. My first job in government, I was in a, a deputy minister, and when I went to talk to members of Congress, I noticed that if I took a male assistant with me, they would talk to the male assistant, not to me. <laughs> so I stopped taking a male assistant. <laughs> but the U.S. changed. There's just no question in my mind. It's not that we still don't have discrimination up and down, but it's more subtle. And uh, the other thing is my career changed. The more power I got, the less problems I had. <laughs> so I did notice that. Uh, but there's no question, at the beginning of the women's movement, um, we were talking about, and I had blatant discrimination at the beginning of my career, but not later in my career. And I've seen all of this change dramatically in the United States, even though we still dr struggle in the academy. Professor Cordova, I must have been very um, lonely in the astrophysics classes for you. I mean, well, it, was, uh, it, it was good for your mother because she was, <laughs> or she, wa she wanted she you in a male-dominant area, that was for sure. 
Um, I, I was one of two women in at Caltech in my PhD class, and the first day of class, the other woman met one of the men, and they disappeared for the rest of the time. They they got married, and they just were isolated, and so, uh, so that was a, an unusual experience. But I've only been been helped by the people around me and and by men. I I don't. I don't feel that I've been disadvantaged. I, I think there are always people, and Donna mentioned one example, of um, that no matter what you're doing, if you're a man or a woman, that there, there are always people out there that are not helpful. And you just have to go around them or over them or, you know, through uh, them. Uh, through them. Uh, but, but you have to, but it's not because, uh, I've always felt it's not because you're a woman. I mean, there are just, people that are not helpful to others. And, but there are, for every one of them, there are nine that are, are tremendously helpful. So I, but I, did you feel you, have to, you had to be better? You had to be uh, smarter? You had to be brighter? Or you felt that you were treated as equal and your, your, your results were tested equally? I, I felt I was treated at, at least equally. I, I really did. I felt people, always, uh, and maybe it was just the environments I w was in, they, they gave people the benefit of the doubt. You know, I, I went to a great school as a, a PhD student. It was a private school, Caltech, which is one of the most famous and distinguished in the United States for sure, right on the top of all the surveys. Um, but maybe because they were a private school, they could take an individual interest in every student. And that's why even though I had a public institution that has 75,000 students over the system, I, I try to, I, I put the, my, the first focus on the student experience and try to get everybody to support each student and back them and mentor them uh, no matter what their um, talents and, and their constraints are to give them a very special experience because I remember my own. I, uh, I came out of English, that was my degree as an undergraduate, and then I went into physics. And the only reason I became a physicist is because the professors did an evaluation and they decided that I could succeed based on my native talents, not based on my GRE scores or anything. They just decided that that I had, as they said, a upward slope, and they would invest in me. And I, I think you have to do the whole uh, assessment of each uh, student and uh, decide that you can make the investment regardless of their backgrounds, because what they will do is surprise you. So I want to I want to pick up from that from that note and ask you, Professor Chagit Messerieron, exactly uh, that seeing the person as a person, not as a not letting um, environmental aspects uh, uh, interfere in the way, is something that is lacking, I guess, in in the science, especially because you see, I mean, you the scissor effect is even more the scissor effect is imagine a scissor. I mean, the scissor effect is even more. Um, dominant in in science and and um, and uh, that field, yeah. Y yes science and, and engineering, yeah. Y yes and no. Um, it, it it is considered that we have two dimensional: the horizontal and the vertical. The vertical dimension is the scissor effect that you are talking about. Uh, the the higher you get, less women there are. The horizontal uh, dimension is with different topics. In my field, electrical engineering is the lesser, I think, even less than astrophysics, right? <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh, actually, in the IEEE, the International Institute of uh, Electrical and Electronics Engineers, now there are like 400,000 members and less than 10% are women. So uh, um, there are not too many, and, and th there is not much of a change over time in electrical engineering. And why is uh, that? This is not my field of research, so I will be very careful in expla giving explanation. Uh, but my experience says that uh, women are more attracted, attracted to fields which are more human or society related, or more directly related. So you can see a change now when you look at uh, emerging fields in engineering, like biomedical engineering or environmental engineering. There you have a much bigger proportion of women even more than 50%. But in traditional fields, like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, there are very little. That's very interesting. You're saying that, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase it very simply, but you're saying that 
you feel that women have to have a kind of a mo uh, it has to be studies from the heart and they have to feel that they can make a change and it's easier for them now when they see that there's an environmental aspect to to engineering yes but again I, I must say that it is based on experience and not on research of course you're <laughs> a scientist i'm a journalist that's the whole thing no, you got okay, it there that's okay you can give the interpretation <laughs> but the numbers show it the numbers show that when the topic is more interdisciplinary and more, more related to other topics then you can see the changes but if i may refer to your uh, previous question about obstacles that a woman may have in her academic career then I can identify two main obstacles. One is internal. Uh, internal meaning that uh, in, in a department, most likely that women faculties will uh, go into what I call service. Serving in committees, doing other service. Instead of taking care of their own career, they are taking care of the department. How to? <laughs> I know that now as a president of the university, when I have new female faculty members, I teach them to take care of themselves before taking care of the university because this is the kind of guidance we need to do. But it is happening and it is uh, very convenient for men because they take the responsibility. That's for amazing. Uh, Have you ever thought so of that? It's amazing. I saw a few yes here in the audience. So. <laughs> and, and the other obstacle is, is cultural. I, I consider it as cultural. But if the university, sorry for interrupting, but if the university would acknowledge that fact and maybe see that as part of their career and assessment of their career, maybe that could make it make a difference, don't you no, think? No, at the end of the day, you get no credit for that. That's it. <laughs> at the end That's of the day, at the end of the day, if the department chair doesn't say to a young woman who's moving up as a scientist, we're not gonna let you take those assignments on. We want you to concentrate on your research and on teaching and not take advantage uh, of a woman, or even if her inclination is to do that, you have to say to her, do not do that. Yeah. And you feel a personal responsibility yes. when you see those young yes. scientists, you say, don't make the mistake, yes. beware? Yes. And who does it then? You have a, you, but you're also a president, then you then need someone to do it. Then I, I, I let men do it. <laughs> 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 and, and the other issue that I refer to, which I call cultural, is a subjective timeline. You know, when, when you consider promotion and you look at uh, what men are doing, you say, okay, he is not promoted for three years, this is a long time. But for a woman, if you look uh, back and you say, she was promoted just four years ago, just like, just like <laughs> yesterday, you know? So this is a subjective measure. And uh, uh, this is something which we should all fight, being aware of the actual date and not how we feel about it. So uh, this was a uh, body of research in this area. Mm -hmm. on, uh, and the studies show that women academics are as bad as the men academics are uh, in terms of their perception of women's careers and how to mentor them. It's very important to retrain everybody. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute, and I wanted to ask uh, Rivka Karmi, you are about to publish uh, your uh, special task force uh, that you head for the um, uh, Committee of Higher Education in Israel, and you are trying exactly to tackle these issues. Could you share with us some of your thoughts and bottom lines and guidelines? So I was chairing uh, the, uh, the committee of the planning and budgeting committee of the Council of Higher Education in Israel, uh, with some very, uh, very known and, and central women in Israel in, in the academia. Um, and we were actually um, writing guidelines for universities uh, based on the known obstacles and barriers that have been identified through all over the world. Actually, it is so amazing how it is similar all over the place in Israel, Europe, and the US. The very same obstacles and barriers exist everywhere. So based on them, we have uh, developed a very um, uh, elaborate document, uh, which hopefully the Council of Higher Education is going to adapt and, uh, and send for all universities to be Im implemented. And uh, you know, I don't want to get into details, but th the main idea is that to look at all those points where women are in a disadvantage, starting from recruitment, all the issues of why women are uh, not as, uh, uh, as uh, effectively recruited by men, and there are some differences there in styles, 
in, in, in by the way, how women are uh, responding, for example, to um, uh, uh, to um, offers, uh, offering of, of positions. I didn't know. Did you know that women don't answer the first announcement? They wait to see whether it is still there, whether there was a, a, a man answering it. Only when it appears on the second time, then they say probably there was no no men there, Let, let's, let's try go for it. So there are some, some, some uh, Th that uh, ideas. That sounds almost un uncomprehensible. Why would they do that? Uh, well, because they're not that Is that, what you, found? Is that, that what you found on your committee? We, uh, we found it after I realized it, it was like one of the, of the uh, surveys was done, but then I reaffirmed it in my own university, yes. That they uh, they uh, respond only to, to the second announcement, uh, saying that, you know, they didn't uh, stand a, a very uh, high chance. The fact that it's still open means that the, there was no capable man that, you know, was, uh, was uh, good for the job. So hopefully this is going to change the face, I think, the face of, of, uh, of gender in universities in Israel, in universities and also colleges uh, as well, because it is really addressing each and every point in in very high details, I myself didn't uh, didn't believe that we'll get there. You know, I was knocking on the doors of the uh, Council of Higher Education in Israel for the past, I would say, five years, and they wouldn't let me get in. It was only the the last the, the, the new um, uh, chairman of the of the uh, planning budget committee. We had him uh, yesterday on our uh, plenary uh, opening uh, the uh, Manuel Trachtenberg that uh, heard me, invited me to give a presentation, was blown away because he didn't know anything. And this is another amazing thing. You know, people don't know the facts. People don't know what, what we think we know. And, and, and he formed this, uh, um, this committee right away. And, uh, and, and I think we are there. And, and in a very short time, we'll have uh, a whole change in the uh, environment there. But, but that's the question, because I think it, you have just uh, the same reports in English sitting in drawers all over the universities around, around the US. We have the same reports sitting in, in drawers all over Europe. And still we are here, as I said, in 2011, talking about the glass ceiling and, and, and talking about the numbers. So what has to change? Well, I, I think our attitudes have to change, but, but not attitudes just about gender. I, I could care less what per people's personal opinions are on, on gender and gender opportunities. What I care about is uh, how a nation can be successful. And you cannot be successful unless you use all of your talent. That's the argument. The argument is an economic one. The argument is a political one, that unless countries, small countries, it's particularly important. Unless you, you provide advantages for every talented person, then you can't succeed because you can't compete against places that have huge populations and can select from those uh, populations. In many ways, American corporations have learned faster than the academies. Mm -hmm. Our corporations, our major industries are much more integrated, even though we're still talking about the glass ceiling. But in terms of opportunities, you go to General Electric and talk to Jeff Immelt, the CEO of General Electric, he sounds like a feminist. The point about women applying for jobs, the fact is that most of the academic jobs are determined by the ability of your sponsor and your mentor to get on the phone and find you a first-rate job. Their whole reputation depends on their ability to place their students. Uh, but they operate differently for women than they do for others. If you see how people get jobs at Caltech, the department at Caltech calls the best departments in the country and says, send me your best student. Yeah. My advisor asked me if I wanted to be an astronaut. And I said, how are you, you going to make me an astronaut? And he said, well, I have a payload going up on the shuttle. If you want to be a, a payload specialist, I will help you. I, I did not want to do that route. I wanted to be a research scientist. But they really actively tried to find the best 
opportunity for you. But yet, but yet we still have to, to try and understand how come there is good intention, there is um, awareness, there is the understanding that it's good for society, and yet, um, it, it's, is, is it any different in your university? Uh, the, ratio, the ratio between women and, and, and men and the, and the staff, I mean, is it, does it look different? Uh, no, actually, most universities in the United States in the undergraduate population have more women than men, okay? And th this is well understood why this is. In our university, we have the opposite ratio because we're such an engineering and agricultural university, and those are occupations that attract more men than women. But the women are catching up, about 43%, and that's in the undergraduate population. So we have a lot of women engineers by numbers because we have 9,000 of our students on the main campus are engineering majors. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's still a big number, but it's, it's a smaller fraction than in other places. But the, the question is, uh, because there was this uh, work done in MIT, for example, yes, and when, uh, when w what's amazing is once MIT made a decision mm -hmm. and put it as a goal, verbalized it and talked with numbers, mm -hmm. it worked. They went from 21, 22 to 31 uh, executive in science department, women executives in science departments within five years. So the thing is, can we do something without putting it as a goal and talking about it and trying to make it happen? I mean, those of us that have tried to move our numbers in terms of increasing the number of women and minorities have had to put economic resources behind it. And in it's not popular? It's popular if you give them more money. No, is it hard to recruit money for that? Uh, no, you, it's, it's a leadership question. And to what extent in the academy can you force a department to consider women candidates? Can, to what extent can you say to a department, for your next three openings, we want to make sure not only that you interview women, uh, all of our evidence is, and all of these are come out of National Academy of Sciences studies, is that if a woman is interviewed, she's likely to get the job. So what we have to do is to get women into the pools and interviewed because they're more likely to get the jobs. But if it's an old boys network that calls their friends in other major universities and asks them for recommendations and get only male recommendations, as opposed to forcing them to go, go more widely and to look for women candidates. The same thing as spending the message to young girls. All of our studies show if we say to young girls, you're as good in math as the boys are, you will actually change their attitudes and increase the number of girls that study math. But they have to, you have to start very young, the same thing with science. You want to hear how to do it with the department? Sure. All right. So I'll give you the example of our department of chemistry, OK? Department of chemistry is a big department here, very successful one. And uh, historically, you know, there is a lot of, of uh, retirement mm -hmm. in, the, in the last three or four years. So. Uh, the undergraduate uh, uh, percentage of students is about 58%, about 53% in PhDs in chemistry, women. So you would think that, you know, at least, at least, you know, one third of the uh, candidates should be women, okay? So they have recruited within three years 12 uh, new faculty, one woman. So you know what I say? The next two positions that you have are being frozen until you find two women. And guess what? They found them. So we have wonderful two new faculty, and the third is, uh, I was just announced yesterday, that there is a third one, an absolutely wonderful woman uh, coming into chemistry. But what were you saying? You get sued. Yeah. I, I, I admire. You would get sued? Sure. sure. We have no, too many lawyers. <laughs> we have too many lawyers. We can't uh, actually say it directly. We can say it indirectly. We can't say it directly. I, I admire the story of uh, Rivka, but uh, uh, following the law of large numbers, this is not the case. And this is quite unfortunate. You were talking about the scissor diagram. If you look at the uh, statistics from Europe or from other places, this is very similar in many countries. It doesn't matter. You can look at countries like Austria, 
that put much effort into promoting women, and you can look at other countries that did nothing, and still you have the same slope. So when you are looking at large number, the changes are very, very slow. Well, the point As is I to look at small numbers. Okay, no, I, 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 I admire you and I think you should do it. But I want to challenge my colleagues here that are sitting here from the social sciences. Actually, I was amazed. I would thought it is kind of a, a a given, nature. naturally, nature. yes, <laughs> because it takes time to change, etc. And then I became a president of a university, which is gender balanced. I cannot take the credit for it. I'm sorry, I would like to. But the Open University in Israel is totally gender balanced in faculty, in boards, in policy makers. That's the way it is. So we have a counter example, and it must be followed by research. How comes one university developed different from all other universities. Do you have any, any in insight? Maybe the open nature of the university, I don't know. But it's amazing because you see in Israel, for example, a, I must say first that the, the, the ch the, there are changes, slow changes, but there are changes. But if you look at universities like the Hebrew University, old university, or new colleges, they keep the same uh, proportion even so they, when the uh, new colleges started, they had the, enough PhD women, not like uh, 50 that, years that's ago. That's true in non-research universities in the United States. The major, what we're talking about is the major research universities. Yeah, we were that's where the guild has operated to exclude women. So Professor Cordova, no, you, wanted to, you wanted to react. In colleges, this is the case. But yeah. I, I want to ask you, is it okay if I ask you a question before you, you comment? No, no, because I, I want to make it clear. I want to make it clear because I think the question on the table is what is, if do you feel once you have reached where you have reached, you have a responsibility? Do you sit in your office and put on the gender glasses? Or once you have made it, you think you have to think of, you? I mean, it's, it would be even unfair of you to put on those glasses. What is your personal stand on that? Do you feel committed to make sure that when you leave your office, something will change in this, in this matter? Oh, oh yes. Uh, for, for myself, I mean, I, I just have to look at my record over the last four years that I've increased uh, by more than 50 percent the number of women and, and 70 percent the number of minorities that are in senior administrative positions. Now the harder thing to do that we were talking about here is with the departments because we do, we do have rules about uh, law, about incentives and how we structure them. And so we can challenge the departments and we do so but in clever ways through our rectors and provosts and all about how they work with the dean and the department heads to create uh, open pools and, and we, we actually have people that look at in our equity offices that look at the results of the finalist and ask challenging questions. Why are there no women or not enough women considering the comparison pool of qualified women nationally for these. So yes, we do stay, we are very committed to staying on top of this but you know we haven't talked about just the um, the life issues that kind of get in the way and make the scissors sort of fall off f faster too and I, I think that's just a very important consideration for women. It's uh, life choices that they have to make uh, or want to make about families at all and how to balance that in a research intensive environment. That, that that's where I think a lot of real mentorship and, uh, on the part of departments and administrators and the whole culture can really help. You, you know, they get discouraged by some of those choices they make at a young age. So you believe the biggest difference is having a mentor? No, I don't think it's having a mentor. I think that, that you have to get into an environment which allows you to make a choice to uh, have a family and raise the family and still be successful. And you can structure uh, a university climate to uh, have good policies about that and to have what we call tenure clocks, the time from starting to uh, achieving tenure and full professorship and all, um, and to um, 
you know, to, so that you can also have a family life. And let me just give you one example in medicine, which I know nothing of, Rivka, but I do know that, that because there are more women now becoming doctors than men in the United States, that the whole culture has changed. So the doctor, in, when I was little, used to be a person that worked 36 hours without sleeping, had no family life, never saw their children, did anything with them. It was a very, very demanding from a lifestyle point of view. Today, because there are so many women, that whole culture has completely changed. They they have very structured hours, and it and it's be, they can raise families. There's just uh, it's it's a lot more healthy culture because there are many more women doctors who have insisted on different family policies in medicine in our country. There's a generational change too because the males are making the same demands. But it's interesting you raised that because Rivka Carmi has just written a few months ago a very controversial article. Uh, in Israel, and saying that the medicine is becoming, uh, you know, has been conquered by 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 uh, dom being dominated by by female is is there's also a price to it, and the price that Rivka sees is that research is is being affected, and the prestige of of the job is. So you you actually saying thirty percent? I'll stop at thirty percent. Want to explain yourself? <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, I, I don't think I, I'll be so cruel, you know. Uh, I will. I Thirty-five. Would, I, would, <laughs> I would set for uh, you know fifty percent top. You know, quality is quality. You know, equality is about fifty percent, uh, and it's getting to be more and more. It's getting to be higher than sixty percent. And what I was saying, first of all, you know, as as, as always, people are, are misquoting or quoting in a way that. They want to do it, and uh, uh, but 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 the truth of the matter was that I was saying, uh, like other professions, and we have a lot of examples for that. What about nursing, social work? What about physical therapy? What about even law today, dominated by by women, um, uh, uh, teaching, uh, of course, uh, and and all of those professions went down in their prestige, went down in their, uh, uh, in their uh, uh, capacity to, uh, um, for salary. I mean, the salary is uh, uh, reduced. So um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can uh, tell there's me something there's else. Mic. There's but another but mic here. But don't, don't, don't give up your mic. Rick, don't uh, give up your mic. There's okay. mic. And, but, but, the, but the main thing that I uh, was alluding to was the fact that the way you put it, France, you know, the whole culture of medicine is changing. But you are saying for the better. I'm, I'm saying not necessarily for the better because you know some of the medical professions are going to extinct. You know, women don't take surgery, especially the the major kind of surgeries, neurosurgery, cardiac surgery. Um, in no time, obviously, they find themselves in more convenient, comfortable places like you know um, uh, um, uh, family medicine, like uh, pediatrics, etc. Give it, you know, some years. We want, we ha will have a huge problem in certain medical professions that will be actually out uh, 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 of place, and 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 research goes uh, hand in hand with that. We don't have in Israel almost no uh, um, um, MDs, women researchers, and I think this is very unfortunate because women bring into research. Something different, something new, something uh, 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 that uh, that that I think very important to the environment and the success. So why aren't you, as a president of the university, um, why why are you so anxious in having more women on your faculty? You should be you should be worried because then it might affect your research. Frankly speaking, if I hear you correctly, our no. First of all, I want them to be on faculty because I want them to be. You know, I, I want. A pluralism kind of a place. So my responsibility, going back to your answer and building on what uh, uh, Donna just said, you know, my responsibility is not necessarily to the gender, but to the university. I want it to be the best university. In, in that regard, I need men and women alike. You know, I need uh, women in the workforce and we, I, I need women in the faculty. I'm not afraid of women in the faculty as long as they really, you know, I, I make sure that they uh, have a free choice, and they can they have the environment to choose whatever profession in medicine they would like to. If you talk about medicine, they would like to take. 
You know, medicine's changing so dramatically, it's hard to sort these issues out as if they're gender issues alone as opposed to lifestyle issues. And what we see is that young men attitudes about being responsible for bringing up the children, wanting to be there for their children. There's enormous pressure on the field and on the profession itself in terms of cost and the kind of pressures on the system. I don't see a lot of evidence that more women coming into a profession in medicine, in engineering, uh, is lowering uh, the ability of the profession to get support, financial support, for example. The dean of our medical school has convinced our faculty senate to extend the clock for tenure, not only for women, but for men too, because they wanted to spend more time with their families and get a better balance. We, of course, have a clinical track in medicine for researchers and, and all sorts of different ways in which we can keep both men and women uh, in research. And I, I really think the burden on us is to organize the profession as opposed to trying to push a round peg into a square hole to organize the service and the profession so that women and men have equal access to it and to make sure that we recruit the next generation of brilliant researchers in our MD, PhD programs by, by changing the way in which the profession is organized. There's no rule that says you have to have a certain kind of years to tenure. We can organize that in a different way and support people in a different way and support their hours in a different way. And, but as long as surgeons continue to be cowboys and, and have a culture in which it's unattractive to women. We're not going to attract mm -hmm. women. But as soon as you change that culture and the leadership of the department is supportive uh, and less sexist as they're going through, you start to attract uh, more women. But I don't see any downgrading of these professions. I, I just want to. I just want to get your view on the on the question: Is do you personally feel a responsibility? Um, wearing gender glasses as president of the university. Absolutely, and I'm not afraid of it. The generation before me were the queen bees, the women that stood up and said, I made it on my own. One of my favorite people on earth was Rosalind Yalow, who won the Nobel Prize. Um, and she used to give, uh, she was a graduate of Hunter College, first American educated woman ever to win the Nobel Prize. She used to show these slides of all of the rejection she got. It was heavily discriminated against. Not until her mentor died and she kept doing work herself did she win the Nobel Prize. She was absolutely convinced that everybody should do it her way without the kind of support system. But she represented a different generation. And our generation believes that not only should we bring eyeglasses for gender but also for race and religion that we have to make sure that everybody has the same opportunities and that we bring our own background and our own experiences. And my hope is that we have a generation of men that also pay attention to these issues. But I'm not afraid of saying I'm a feminist. I'm not afraid of saying that I reach out to women um, and I try to lift my sisters up at the, at the same time. But that's because I, my whole career is built on the shoulders of a generation of, of feminists who change the way in which women are viewed around the world. And so I feel a special responsibility, but, but I also at the same time want to make sure it's not just for women, it's also for underrepresented minorities. Haven't I told you we'll have an inspirational conversation, Chagit Messerion. I just want to get your take before I take two or three questions about your, um, your personal um, responsibility. If you feel one, if, you're, if you think it's okay to say that you have one, is it politically correct to say that you have one? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. No, I, 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 I'm obliged and I'm responsible and I do whatever I, I can for gender balance. And uh, th there was a very interesting debate here about medicine, but I want to focus on women in science because of two reasons. One reason that was mentioned before is, is the business case. We, used to, we, we must use the, the person power that we have not to lose the potential and this is important and gender balance is important because otherwise we get people who are less talent to do the job. I mean, middle men instead of brilliant women. So uh, <laughs> it's important. When a middle, um, 
a medium, you know, performance woman would uh, occupy uh, a medium performance, whatever men. I mean, now Bella you oh, oh, wait, say 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 it in, in, say it in proper English. Ah, oh, oh. <laughs> when a mediocre woman gets the same job as a mediocre oh, man. Oh, okay, <laughs> write so, that down because I'm going to write okay. it down. Okay, and and the the other issue, which is special, I think, for for science, is we use our uh, credential as scientists to make you people believe that what we are saying is true, that we are unbiased, that we are unbiased, that we are, uh, we did research, we know where we are talking. Uh, if we have bias at home, a gender bias, then it hurts our uh, credential. So I think we are obliged for gender balance. I do whatever I can. And I think that the first step is awareness. Just say, look for the better women, you will find them because there are many like this around. Yes. Uh, Oh, great. Well, let's start with the lady in green. Thank you very much. Um, There's a mic. There's to Thank you. No, I think I'm loud enough. Uh, <laughs> Just introduce yourself, OK? Uh, my name is Ella. I'm a master degree. I'm doing my master degree in political and government studies here at the university. I studied here my undergrad. And then I went traveling in Africa. And I'm doing uh, my research in Kenya at the moment. Um, I want to first thank you very much for the beautiful panel. It was fascinating to hear all of you. You're giving a lot of inspiration for starting research like me. And I hope I'll be able to do at least half of what you all women have done. Uh, thank you also very much for uh, the Blotowski family for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity and everything. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm here as a student at the university for several years, and we've been working here with the women uh, that's cleaning our universities in order to get them, uh, them uh, rights as uh, working in our societies. And what's special about the Ben Gurion University is that it's, it's in the Negev. It's, uh, according to Ben Gurion's vision, it was meant in order to promote men and women in the Negev. And we've been. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be. I'm going to be a I'm, bit rude because I want to uh, enable more questions. One of the one of the, the things with the women, with the, uh, the women that they don't get the right to bring them kids to university as as uh, professors and people and uh, lecturers that are part of this university. And I would like to ask uh, your uh, honors, what can we do in order to help or in order to work with these women that they will get also the right. Uh, to be part, to take part in the universities that have been built in the Negev in order to uh, take them as in our community. And thank you. Uh, were, you referring, were you referring to the fact that they can be part of the events or get tuition free? I, uh, At first, both. I think both. that they, uh, part of our community, we all want to see them, uh, some of them working 15, 20 years in, in this university, cleaning this university. Okay. I want them to be part First of First of all, it's very community. warming that that would Thank be your you. question. I'm amazed because usually people would ask about their own career. So I think we have an example of caring and sharing, and that's very, that's very enlightening and inspiring. Thank university. you very much. And uh, Rishma, can you help us with the question? Yeah, we are very, very proud of our students. Actually, they led a very robust, you know, drive. Uh, to improve the conditions and the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the cleaning, um, uh, we mostly women, but not only, in this university. But this is a different issue. This is totally different issues. We are still debating on certain, you know, issues vis-a-vis -vis this problem. I don't think it is really, you know, one okay. of a part of what we are discussing right here and today. So let me take one more question. But it, oh, if sure. Took on the issue of cleaning people. Uh, first, at Hunter College in New York, where I discovered that uh, a large number of our lower level workers were not literate, and that is they couldn't read and write. And so, as part of their contract, we built a program uh, to teach them literacy. Um, and I've, I've never forgotten the impact it had because everybody complained that if we we made people literate, we would lose them as workers because then they would go on to higher positions. And I told them that I thought we were an educational institution and that was exactly what we ought to do. So what we did was we, I, we identified, we sat with the workers to see what they really needed. And one of the things they needed was that so many of them didn't know how to, how to write or, or to read. Um, 
And at my current institution, a very large percentage of our cleaning people don't speak English. They speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so we provide English classes during the hours of their work. They don't have to come in for earlier hours because they work long hours as it is. And, um, and one of uh, the gardeners at the university stopped me the other day and said, I'm already up to the third level. Are you going to offer the fourth level uh, of English? So I think universities can find small things that they can do that actually will improve um, the opportunities for everyone because we have the skill sets to do that. It doesn't cost very much money, but it does identify something that's important um, for the workers. Well, the work is is, uh, is a very good example here, but this university is 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 extensively involved with the community, with the whole community, with the Jewish community, with the Arab community. He's yeah, here, <laughs> absolutely, and we have a lot of projects, um, mainly for uh, general poverty, but also for extremely illiterate per people, people uh, Bedouin as well as Ethiopians. So it is, you know, this is a very uh, confined kind of an issue. Uh, that we are debating about women all the... Yeah, this is another debate that we have, a political one. I don't think we I should... I think Ben-Gurion University is, is proving to be a very uh, lively and interesting place. It's absolutely. It's really amazing, it, yes. it is it is a very, a, a very socially aware and involved university, and we are very much encouraging our students to do so. And here is an example. What are you doing about it? And I'm yeah, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? About the workers of the Mechina, okay. women. Okay, we heard you. Thank you for your comment. One last comment over here. But you said what you did, and keep repeating it. Keep repeating it. You know, I came from an Arab family. My family is Arab American. I'm Lebanese. Uh, and my father, who had only an eighth grade education, believed in women's education encouraged my mother, who had a college degree, to go to law school, for example. But years later, I found out that he encouraged not only my sister and me to go to college and insisted, but all of the males that he knew in the Arab American community and in, in our community in Cleveland, he, he argued with them about sending their daughters to college. And even now, I meet um, women who had the opportunity to go to college, and they said, because my father convinced their fathers. And we found an old letter to the editor that he wrote to the Cleveland newspaper long before he ever married my mother, arguing for women's education. So I had a very unique experience um, of an Arab male who was the head of his family's household. He was the firstborn who had this attitude, wherever he got it, I don't know, it certainly wasn't one of my grandfathers. Um, uh, he, he simply thought it was part of being an American, was to encourage women to go get an education. So that's where yes. I got it from. I, I want to thank you for the question. I personally believe that uh, when I ask successful women, the, it, is, it is always home. And I want to take this opportunity to thank my father, who died 10 years ago, Dad Messer. He was actually on the board of governance of Ben Gurion University. And he encouraged me to believe that I can do whatever I want to do. Unfortunately, I disappointed him because I didn't get the Nobel Prize by the age of 30. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, besides, I think. Thank you so much, Professor Rivka Karmi, Professor Donna Ishalala, Professor Franz M. Cordova, and Professor Khalid Messer Yaron. It was Truly uh, one of the most interesting panels for me. I have written down many uh, notes and I will take them on, uh, especially I'm waiting for the day that mediocre women will get the jobs of mediocre men. And then I know we can put this subject uh, at the end. Thank you very much for taking part in, in hearing us. And I'd like to ask Anne to give you some more direction. <laughs>